Well, good morning, church. Come on in and find a nice, comfortable seat. It's wonderful to see all of you here this morning. This is a wonderful day, a day where we get to see God work in new believers as we baptize them in his name. That's pretty wonderful. So as we start our service off, I'd like you all to stand and read with me from Psalm 145. And repeat with me. Let's read it together. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in awe of how great and how unsearchable are your ways. We thank you for the gift of the Lord Jesus and his salvation, and we worship you for it this morning. We ask that our minds and hearts would be attuned to you and that all our distractions would be set aside as we lift, lift up your name in praise. May it be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.
of wicked men you finally destroy. Your power will proclaim till Christ descends, and you will reign forever without end. How great is the Catechism for today asks about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And the question is, what do we believe about the Holy Spirit? And one of the places in Scripture that gives us an answer is uh, John 14, 16 through 17, which says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So let's answer it together, the answer to that summary. That, that he is God, co-eternal with the Father and the Son, and that God grants irrevocably to all who believe. So every believer is granted the indwelling of God himself. Would you pray with me? God, our, our Savior and our help, uh, we thank you for sending this Spirit to live in us. Thank you that he encourages us, chastens us, disciplines us, strengthens us, and comforts us. Let us live lives of faith in his power, not our own. Let us walk the path of obedience filled with his joy. Amen and amen. Good morning, FBC. For those of you who can't see back here, there's a nice warm baptismal tub, and I am standing in a whole lot of water, and I just peekabooed a minute ago because I forgot we were doing the catechism first. So some of you probably saw me walk out here and wondered what I was doing. But uh, today's a really special day. The Holy Spirit has moved in the lives of several individuals in this church, and they have put faith in Jesus and so we are going to be baptizing four individuals today. And um, I just want to say baptism is not required for salvation. It's kind of like a wedding ring. A wedding ring publicly proclaims my relationship with my wife. And baptism publicly proclaims our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And it's actually something that Jesus had his disciples do to people who followed him. And we've been commanded to baptize people. And so one of the things that um, it represents, it actually represents two things. One of the things it represents is the life, death, and burial and resurrection of Jesus. But it also, for the specific believer, represents their decision to follow Jesus, to die to themselves, and to be raised again to a new life in which they are now following Jesus and he is doing a work in their lives. So I'm gonna pray real quick and then we're gonna get this show on the road. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and we thank you that you are doing a work through your Holy Spirit here at FBC Ashland. We thank you that you are impressing yourself upon the lives of individuals and you're calling them into relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you that you don't just call people into relationship with you and then leave them but you transform them, you walk with them in this life. And Lord, I pray for these four individuals. I pray for Tommy, for Dallas, for Maddie, and for Han Lien. Lord, that you would continue to do your work in their lives and that you would conform them into your image. 
Lord, thank you for the blessing it is to us to be able to see them baptized today. And Lord, thank you that you're still doing a work in all of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Tommy, why don't you come on down? All right, Tommy, have you put faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, then I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I wanted you all to see it. All right. Dallas, will you come on down? All right, Dallas, have you put faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? I have, yes. Perfect. I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, Maddie, come on down. Maddie, have you put faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. All right, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Leon, come on down. Hon Leon, she goes by Susan. Hon Leon is her Mandarin name. And she has put faith in Jesus. And actually, in Eastern culture, the number four represents death. And today's the 14th. And when you add the one to the four, it actually amplifies death in Eastern culture. So it's a really big deal that she is getting baptized today. And it is a beautiful picture of Jesus overcoming death. So Hong Lian, have you put faith in Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Okay. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Trying not to get the microphone wet. Well, thank you, everybody. This concludes our baptisms, and I'm going to give it to Mark next. So we're making another transition here. Helps if I put my mic up to my mouth, doesn't it? Everybody hear me now? Um, many of you may have received an email um, about a special offering request that we received this week and the elders discussed uh, for the pregnancy center. And so over the past several years, uh, our church has supported the pregnancy center with the baby bottle fundraising. You remember that. And that center provides a safe environment in which to meet the physical needs of moms and their kids who are often in crisis. And the center ministers the gospel to those women and their children. So a few years ago, the pregnancy center opened the Esther House, a place where moms and their kids can live up for up to two years, rather than living on the street without any resources to meet their basic needs. And Esther House also ministers the gospel. 
And so recently, unexpected costs have strained their budget, such as the cost of pregnancy testing, prenatal care, among other things. So as they seek God's counsel for, for how to continue forward and keep things running, they've reduced their staff and are trying to avoid making program cuts and service cuts. But they've reached the critical point where they can't continue without some financial assistance. And they've reached out to several churches in the valley to help them meet a huge need of $70,000 to continue their service. So Pastor Adam has spoken with Beth Sheets, who's the director of the Esther House, about their needs. And as I mentioned, the elders decided that we should try to assist with a special offering in whatever amount we can. Now the goal for our church is 3,500, not 70,000. And this is where all of you come in. We're going to be passing the deacon fund plate this morning to help meet this important need. And please, don't, don't feel pressured to give. You're not under compulsion to give. But if you'd like to, you may do so in any amount that you want to. If you're going to write out a check, please make it to the Pregnancy Center and not FBC Ashland. And in the memo line, write Esther House. So we think this is a wonderful way um, that we can serve this ministry. And the elders appreciate how generous our church is and continues to be. And so to invest in this particular ministry, I think, is to invest in God's kingdom. And who knows how many moms and kids God may bring to saving faith through the continuation of this house. So let's be a part of that work. And as I said, no pressure, um, but give freely if you feel like it. So the ushers will come forward now and pass the plates. So thank you everyone for your generosity. Let's stand and continue worshiping together. Mount of thy redeeming love. 
seated. Good morning again, FBC. I had to change real quick. If you're new with us, welcome. My name is Adam, and I'm the teaching pastor here. But first things first, praise God for his movement here in our church. We got to see a little bit of that this morning with people publicly proclaiming their faith through baptism. Today, though, we are gonna be looking at John chapter four, verses 31 through 54. In a minute, I'm gonna read the scripture, then we're gonna pray, then we're gonna jump into the message. So, John chapter four, verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought uh, him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say there are yet four months, then comes harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine, and at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour. The fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. This is God's word. Let me pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We are so thankful. We are thankful that you sent Jesus to save us. And Jesus, we are thankful that you did it, that you completed the work, that you lived the life that we cannot, that you became the punishment for our sins. You bore our punishment upon yourself. And then, Lord, you died and you rose again, giving us eternal life. Father, we ask this morning that you would do a mighty work through your Holy Spirit, that you would conform us more into the image of Jesus, that you would help us to be more like Jesus, and Lord, that you would show up and just change our hearts. Lord, we ask that you be glorified this morning, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, a few years ago, my son got a basketball hoop, uh, basketball hoop for his birthday, and it came with instructions. And the point of instructions is, it so, is so that you're able to put it together correctly. Now, how many of you think I use those instructions? And men, how many of you would admit to using instructions? Not a hand raised. Janet, you're not a man. <laughs>
It's something as simple as a basketball hoop, or so I thought. So I kind of did look at the instructions, just kind of glazed over them, and then I started putting everything together. And we got it all done in about an hour, and then I realized the base was on backwards. We couldn't even stand the thing up. It became now a really cool ground decoration. So guess what I had to do? Well, the way it was designed, I had to pretty much take the whole thing apart to be able to put it back together correctly. This time, I was like, okay, I see how it works. I don't really need the instructions. I, I can see this. So I didn't look at the directions very carefully again, as I probably ought to, and uh, I put it all together, and now the arm to raise and lower the basketball hoop was on the wrong bar. So I had to, once again, take a few things apart, and finally, it worked. Man, had there only been some instructions. Or maybe it was my stubbornness that thought just skimming through the instructions, I could get it done. And because of my stubbornness, what should have taken me an hour with my son ended up taking almost four hours. And here's the deal. The manufacturer of the company, they provided me with instructions. It was their will that I should be able to put it together pretty quickly and correctly, but I chose not to follow what they willed for me, what they wanted for me. And the same is true in our relationship with God. God has made it very clear what he expects from us, and that is to never sin, to never rebel against him, to always be holy. But Adam and Eve messed that up in the garden when they intentionally chose to disobey God, and now we are all born into that sin, into that rebellion, and it's actually become impossible for us to be holy. But crazy enough, God still loves us. He still wants relationship with us, even though we've rebelled against him and sinned against him. So God had a plan. He knew what he would do. He knew what it would take to redeem us. And that was that God himself, God the Son, Jesus, would come down and he would do the will of the Father. He would live a sinless life, totally holy. He would follow God's instructions to a T. And then not only that, would, he would perfectly follow the Father's will, but in following the Father's will, he would go to the cross and become the sacrifice for our sins. He would take on the punishment that we deserve so that we could be bought back by God. That we could be redeemed. That we could have a restored relationship with God. And then he would raise from the dead, defeating both sin and death and showing us that he has the power not only to make us right with God, but give us eternal life. And this was the will of the Father. And because Jesus lives in perfect relationship with the Father, it was his will to save us as well. So Jesus perfectly fulfills the Father's will. He follows the instructions and puts us back together. And if we put faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, we can have that relationship with the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. So a little bit of context here. Last week, we saw Jesus spoke to the woman at the well. He told her about the living water, which is eternal life. We saw him lovingly tell her her sin. And what was incredible was that this was breaking all the cultural norms. He spoke with a woman. He spoke with a woman who was from a mixed race that his culture hated. And she was a sinner. And she was a sinner in two ways. One, she did not worship God in the way that God had called those who were Jewish to worship him. And two, she was an adulterer who was shunned by her own community. And from it, we learned that Jesus welcomes outsiders. Jesus provides eternal life to those outsiders, and Jesus transforms those outsiders. And by way of application, we realized we're all outsiders when it comes to a holy and righteous God because we're all sinners. And knowing that God accepted us as outsiders, it should have an effect on our hearts so that we also accept outsiders, people who are not just like us. And we show them the love of Jesus as he calls them into his kingdom. And then we saw that woman at the well so transformed that she went into town and started telling those people who had shunned her about Jesus. And those people started coming to Jesus. And that is where we find ourselves today. 
after the woman at the well, a conversation with Jesus is going to take place with his disciples, and Jesus is going to spend time with and minister to these Samaritans that this woman has told her about. And then we're gonna see a man who was most likely a Gentile, not even Jewish, in need of Jesus to heal his son. And why is Jesus doing all of this? Well, he's providing us signs and wonders that he is God and that he has come to save us from our sins. And he does all of this because it is God the Father's will. Jesus' will lines up perfectly with God the Father's. And so if Jesus is doing something, it is because it is the Father's will for him to do this, which is why my big idea this morning is Jesus does the Father's will. Jesus does the Father's will. A couple weeks ago, we, we looked at John chapter three, and in it, Jesus replied to Nicodemus. He says, the Father loves the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the Father loves the world. The Father gave his son. It's the Father's will. And if we go back into the Old Testament, the prophets explained that the system of worship that God had set up for Israel was to make them a light to the Gentiles. In other words, it was to attract the Gentiles to relationship with God. And even if we go so far back as to Genesis, the first book of the Bible, in chapter three, verse 15, God promised after Adam and Eve sinned that he would raise up a redeemer so God's will, God the Father's will from the moment we messed up has been to bring us back into relationship with him. And Jesus is the one literally doing that work for that to happen because Jesus follows the will of the Father. And we're going to see that as we look at the scripture today. We're gonna see that everything Jesus does is the Father's will because Jesus does the Father's will which means it's the Father's will to save us, to bring us into relationship with him. We can't do it on our own. It's only God that saves. And this is what Jesus, through his life, death, burial, and resurrection is doing, saving us, because it's the Father's will to save us, so it's Jesus' will to save us. Which is why my first point is, the Father's will is to save. The whole point of Jesus' ministry was to save mankind from spiritual death and from the, excuse me, and from their rebellion against God. And, and even today, that's the point of ministry. That is what we're doing here at FBC Ashland. We are participating with what God is doing to save people so that they can have a relationship with Jesus by putting faith in him for the forgiveness of sins. And that is all because God the Father wants relationship with the people that rebelled against him. We can't do it ourselves, so he does it for us through the work of Jesus. So let's get into the scripture here. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. All right, at this point, Jesus had finished up his conversation with the woman at the well. The disciples had shown back up with the food that they bought from the Samaritans. And the disciples were shocked to find Jesus talking with a woman of ill repute, from the Samaritan race. They don't say anything, but the Bible tells us they were shocked. And after she leaves, they're like, hey Jesus, have something to eat. They just saw something crazy going on in spiritual terms. They saw Jesus breaking the norms of the racism and the classism and the sexism that happened in that culture. And they're like, hey, you should eat something. They're not thinking of spiritual things, they're thinking of physical things. Hey, let's eat. They tell Jesus to eat, but Jesus is going to once again use physical things to draw them into deeper spiritual understanding. Jesus says, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And so the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? I mean, this is kind of funny. The disciples still thinking physically, they're like, well, what, what do you mean? Does he have something we don't know about? Does Jesus have like a little snack pack on him? Maybe some gummy bears? They, they don't get it. And Jesus said to them, my will, or my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. 
Jesus says, my food is to do the Father's will and accomplish the Father's work. So now we're starting to see something. Jesus is saying he does the will of the Father. And we're starting to see what the Father's will is in that Jesus just had this conversation with this woman of ill repute. We're starting to understand a spiritually fundamental truth. God wants to save us. And then Jesus is saying, he's saying, look, guys, physical strength comes from food, right? He's saying if you don't put in the calories, you can't put out the calories. If you don't eat, you get weak. You can't run. You can't lift things. You can't do the work. But when it comes to God, when it comes to spiritual things, God is our strength to do the spiritual things that God is calling us to do. And Jesus, in his humanity, is relying on the Father to do the things that the Father has called him to do. And he's gonna do those things. Now, it's kind of crazy. I can tell you from experience that when we do the things God calls us to do, it can, yes, be exhausting. It was exhausting when I did the all-night lock-in last October with the youth group. I think I slept for 18 hours after I got home. I think Leif and I were the only, oh, and my wife, Teresa, we were the only ones to make it through the whole night with the kids. The other leaders fell asleep. We were exhausted. And sometimes, even after I preach, I'm physically exhausted. A lot of you have heard me say this. I'm gonna go home and take a nap now. But in doing God's will in our lives, it gives us the strength in the long term to keep doing God's will in our lives. It is God who spiritually sustains us and that spiritual sustenance keeps us moving forward in our relationship with God, willing to do his will over and over in our lives. And Jesus says, do not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Okay, this... um, there are yet four months, then the harvest comes, was a Jewish proverb. And it would be said about a, it's yes, said about the physical act of planting crop, right? They would plant crop in the November time frame, and then four months later, they would reap the harvest. But this proverb is used to describe things that took work with a delayed benefit. And what Jesus is telling these guys is that their ministry is ripe for harvest now. The work has been done. The the seeds have been sowed. Guys, John the Baptist did his ministry in preparing the hearts for us and even the prophets of the Old Testament. What Jesus is trying to do is get their eyes off of purely the physical, but look at the spiritual. Jesus is saying, guys, people are ready to come into my kingdom by putting faith in me, so let's get to work. And then he says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Jesus is saying, God the Father in his will has been working on this sowing Seed for a long time. And this sowing seed is bringing people to salvation, to relationship with God for himself. He's been working on it for a long time. And he sent others to sow seeds before you guys. So now is the time we're gonna reap the harvest. And that white for harvest, that means ripe for harvest. Jesus is saying, don't tell me we have to sow seeds right now because the harvest is ready. It's already here. And now the sower and the reaper can actually celebrate together. One of the really cool things about the economy of God's kingdom is that we actually sow and reap the harvest at the same time. In fact, oftentimes, what we're reaping when we're seeing people come to faith in Jesus is because of the work of others before us, the sowing that others have done. They may have heard the gospel a hundred of times, but we are here for the harvest. Past pastors of this church, past members of this church have sowed seed and we're seeing a harvest. And oftentimes the things we sow in this life, when we sow seeds, we don't actually get to see the fruit of that harvest until we get to eternity. One of my elders 
He told me a story that when he used to work on campuses and tell people about Jesus, he would tell them the gospel, they would actually get upset at him and they would yell at him. And then years later, decades later, that person would come up to him and say, hey, don't you remember me? And he's like, no, should I? And they're like, yeah, you told me all about Jesus and then I yelled at you? And then I went home and I prayed to receive Jesus and I found a church? So the person who told him about Jesus didn't even get to see the harvest. And there's a point of application there for us. Sometimes we don't wanna tell people about Jesus because we're like, well, it hasn't done anything before. I haven't seen anyone get saved. The truth is you have no idea what that seed you plant is going to do. So don't be discouraged when you tell people about Jesus and maybe you don't see any fruit in their lives. You might not find out until eternity that quite the harvest was reaped from the seeds you planted. So let's unashamedly proclaim the good news of Jesus because we don't know what the fruit will look like. Some of that fruit's not even gonna be ready for harvest until we leave this earth. But it also means that sometimes we need to be ready for surprise harvests. And I gotta be honest, we're seeing some of that now. We just saw four people get baptized. And as a church, over the last year, we've practically doubled in size. That's not because of us. That is because of what God is doing and what he has done through other people who have sowed seeds. And maybe some of the seeds we've sowed, but we can't get all cocky. God is the one that does this stuff for his kingdom. Because if you really think about it, if you plant a seed, is it because of you that there's a crop? You don't control the soil, you don't control the sun, and you don't control the rain. Sure, you can add some fertilizer, you can water it once in a while, and you can give it artificial light. But even then, there's no guarantees that that strawberry or that tomato won't show up with blithe and die. God does the work of the harvest. We're just here to reap it. And he's doing that through us anyway. So we must plant our gospel seeds so that we get to participate in what God is doing in the lives of others to trust him. And let's trust God to make a harvest, whether we see it or not, whether we gather the fruit or somebody else gathers it. And we're about to see what some of that spiritual harvest looks like from the woman at the well. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So in this case, there had been some sowing before in the sense that the Samaritans did believe in the first five books of the Bible. They had an idea that there was a coming Messiah. And then this woman went and told them about her experience with the Messiah. And there were many who believed in Jesus. There was a harvest. So the Samaritans came to him. They came to Jesus. They asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. So here is Jesus in a community that culturally he is supposed to hate. And he is doing ministry there. And now many more are believing in him. This is the Father's will, that whoever should believe in him should have everlasting life, and Jesus is doing this will, this ministry, so that people will put faith in him for the forgiveness of sins and have eternal life. Jesus is ministering to a bunch of outsiders he's supposed to hate, people who you would think if you were a good Jew in the day, that they would have no special standing with God because they've been doing everything wrong. Because these were people who abandoned the Jewish faith in favor of pagan ideals. But here is Jesus, he's loving them. He's telling them the truth about God and how their salvation comes through Jesus. And we can, we can, we can really assume that he was certainly doing miracles and healing people. Because he was doing all this in the Father's will to save them. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Even these Samaritans are starting to recognize something that most Jewish people wouldn't have recognized at this point, and that was Jesus was the savior of the world, not just the Jews. 
So this woman, she participated in the harvest, and as those people were harvested for faith, it was no longer about what she said, but what about Jesus said. And this should be true of us. As we sow and we reap spiritual seed by telling people about Jesus, once they have put faith in Jesus, it's not, they shouldn't be focused on what we think about. Their focus should be on Jesus himself. Now, we do have a part in holding them accountable and training them up and teaching them and discipling them. But their focus shouldn't be on whether we approve of them or whether they can impress us. But what does Jesus want from them? What does Jesus want them to do? What is Jesus calling them to do? As believers, our job isn't to impress other believers. It's to serve God. And if God is calling us to do something that we know through his word is correct, then we do that. Now, I'm gonna say this. If there is outright sin in someone's life or in our own life, it's good that other believers are letting you know. But our job isn't to impress other believers. It's to serve God. And that may be the way that God is telling us through other believers that there's something that he wants to transform in our lives. But that's what's happening here. The Samaritans are saying, thanks for letting us know about Jesus because now our focus can be on Jesus. And it's the word of God that strengthens our relationship with God and they're hearing it. They're hearing the word of God straight from God himself, from Jesus. Because Jesus is following the Father's will and the Father's will is to save and that is exactly what happened here with a bunch of outsiders. Jesus saved them because his will perfectly aligns with the Father's, and therefore it is the Father's will to save. So what have we learned so far? We have learned that Jesus does the Father's will. He did everything in perfect submission to God the Father because God the Son shares the same will as God the Father, and in his willingness to follow the Father's will, Jesus saved us from our own sin. He went to the cross as the sacrifice for us when he took on our punishment for sin, he defeated that sin, he rose from the dead and defeated death all so that we can have eternal life in the presence of Jesus forever. We have learned that it was the Father's will to save us all along. God promised it in the garden that he would send a savior. But how do we know this is true? Let's think of it this way. I once went to court as a support to someone who was going through a, a court battle and I got to watch our legal system and how it operates. And one of the things that really surprised me was that it's not like what you see on TV. Not all the lawyers and the judges have all the laws and case precedents memorized. Actually, the judge was like, I don't remember, let me look it up. That was the judge. He's looking it up on Google in the courtroom. The lawyers, they couldn't remember if certain precedents counted in certain types of trials or only if it was criminal trials. But as both lawyers were trying to prove their points, they presented evidence to the judge, as the judge would be the one that decides this case. There wasn't a jury. The lawyers were showing text messages from one party to another. They were showing documented behaviors. They were bringing in witnesses. They each submitted evidence in support of their case. And here's the deal. Jesus has given us plenty of evidence to prove that he is the Messiah, that he is the God that saves, the one sent by the Father because the Father's will was to save us. Now, on the one hand, if you read the Old Testament, it very plainly points ahead to Jesus. It even describes his death on the cross hundreds of years before it would happen. Then as Jesus is here on earth doing his miracles and his ministry, He's showing us evidence. He's doing miracles. And the point of these miracles wasn't for us to demand that he do more for us, right? But it was to show us his love for us, that he is the Messiah who could save us from our sin. There were many eyewitnesses to Jesus' ministry, and many of those followers who saw the things that he did, they willingly went to their death because they knew the hope that was waiting for them in eternity. They weren't going to deny Jesus at that point because they saw what he could do, they saw what he did. And even, even at that, the Jewish community was upset um, and so was the Roman community because Jesus rose from the dead. So they started spreading a lie. 
they said, well, the disciples, they stole his body. But those disciples, all of them, were eventually tortured and horribly killed. What would they have to gain from dying in that manner if they had just stolen the body? Surely one of them would have said, okay, stop torturing me. Here's the body. That never happened. And then for those of us who have put faith in Jesus, we can see a sign now. We have our own eyewitness testimony because he has transformed our lives. If we have truly put faith in Jesus and we're putting him first and we've walked with him for a little while, we can start to see that where we used to struggle with something, maybe we don't anymore. We're actually progressing. And we actually start to become acutely more aware of what we are currently struggling with, the things that Jesus is transforming in our lives right now. Jesus has presented us with evidence that he is the Messiah, that he is following the Father's will, and that will is to save us from our sins. Jesus gives us signs. Jesus gives us signs. That's my second point. After two days, he departed for Galilee. All right, we know from Jesus' ministry that he often showed signs that he was the Messiah. He did this intentionally so that more people would come to put faith in him during his ministry on earth. And this was the Father's will for him to do this so that the people could come to relationship with God. He just spent two days in Samaritan territory, in unclean territory. And the first thing he did was show that woman at the well his omniscience when he told her <coughs> the private details of her life that no mere human stranger should have known. And then all the Samaritans asked him to stay and he stayed two days and we know that he was teaching them because they, it says they believed his word. But every time Jesus is in an area teaching people, he also miraculously helps people. So we can safely assume that he was healing people and doing miracles, telling them things only an omniscient God would know. And even if he did none of that, he was so omniscient he knew exactly how to say what to say that so that so many Samaritans who hated Jews would believe in a Jewish Messiah. He gave them signs over those two days, but now he's gonna go off to Galilee. And it says in verse 44, <clears throat> for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Verse 44 starts off weird. It says, Jesus testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And Nazareth was a city in the, Gal the area of Galilee, and that was Jesus' hometown. And from the book of Luke, we know that his hometown got so mad at him that they actually tried to throw him off a cliff. So he's pretty known in the area of Galilee, and this welcoming that the Galileans do, it's not a true welcoming. It's, it's not a real kind of honor. What these people at this point were looking for were more signs. Many people in Jesus' ministry, when they saw his ministry, they didn't want to put faith in him. They wanted him to do things for them. It's the kind of honor that you would give a genie in a bottle. Hey, since you can do that kind of miracle, I want you to do stuff for me. That's the kind of honor he received from the people in Galilee. And as followers of Jesus, we need to be careful that we don't treat God like a genie in a bottle. We don't get to demand that God does what we think he ought to do. We gotta remember, he is God. And what's important to God is bringing people to spiritual health through the forgiveness of sins, through the work of Jesus. Not always is the physical things that we wanna see the most important. Not always is Jesus going to do the physical things that we think he ought to do because his, his priority, his mission in line with the Father's will is to help us spiritually and not always do the physical things we want done actually help us spiritually. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, goes to a different town, Cana, where he had made the water into wine. That was Jesus' first public miracle. He turned water into wine. Now he's back in that same town where he turned the water into wine at the wedding feast. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. 
When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. All right, this official, he was somebody who was likely a non-Jewish official of King Herod, and he did have a type of faith, and we're gonna get to that in a minute. Listen, word about miracles spreads quickly, and this man is having what is called a crisis faith. There's a crisis going on, and he's going to seek out what he thinks can help in this crisis. So he seeks out and actually travels from Capernaum to Cana, which is about 25 miles, travels by foot, to ask Jesus to heal his son. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Jesus isn't just talking to this man. In the Greek, the word you, when he says you see, unless you see signs, you will not believe. It's plural. Jesus is talking to the crowd and the man that has gathered to Jesus. So on the one hand, he's starting to try to get the crowd to think about the spiritual, not the physical act of a miracle. And on the other hand, Jesus is eliciting a response from this, this non-Jewish official. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. This man in his crisis faith isn't going to waver. He doesn't say, yeah, you know what? Let me see a sign. He just says, come and heal my son. And Jesus is going to do what he often does, and that's take crisis faith and turn it into real faith. Jesus simply says to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went his way. This man's crisis faith is starting to turn into real faith. He doesn't need to see a sign from Jesus to let him know he can trust him. Hey, listen, you just told me to go and my son's gonna live. Can you like do some sort of magic where you pull a rabbit out of a hat so that I know you're telling me the truth? No, he just goes. He believes and trusts. What Jesus says is going to happen is going to happen. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. 1 p.m. would be the seventh hour. And that was when the fever left him. The father knew what that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. All right, this last bit tells us a few things. One, Often in the Bible, the New Testament, especially the New Testament, when one person <coughs> comes to faith, the Bible mentions if their whole household comes to faith. Now, it's not always the case, but it does happen often because God cares about families. He cares about the family unit. It's the way that he designed us to be within a family unit. But it also tells us that God honors Christ's faith and God is going to do what it takes to turn that crisis faith into real faith. Now this was the second sign that he did in Cana. He healed the boy in Capernaum from Cana and the word spreads quickly so people are recognizing this as the second sign, the first being uh, several days ago when he turned the water into wine. But I need us to understand that this journey from Capernaum to Cana is a 25 mile journey which would be about a day's walk to get back to Cana from Capernaum. So this man, this official, after having heard what Jesus said, that his son would be healed, he could have made it back to Capernaum by the next day at 1 p.m. He could have not stopped and he could have not slept. He could have gotten back to his son by 1 p.m. the next day. But the Bible tells us that the service met him along the way and it tells us that Jesus had spoke those words the day before. This means that this official is on the second day of his journey. It's a one day journey. Now, if I thought my son might not live, do you think I'm gonna stop and sleep? Not if I can help it. I'm gonna charge on through the night, I'm gonna get back to my son. So there's actually some application for us here in this part of scripture. This man trusted Jesus. So are we like this man who trusts Jesus or are we like the Galileans wanting more signs and treating God like a genie? God, if you do this for me, then I'll do what you're calling me to do. 
As followers of Jesus, we have already been given signs. And even for those who are on the fence about following Jesus, this is the reason we have the word of God. Here's your sign. We don't need to be looking for God to be our personal genie because God has given us his word. He actually transforms us when we put faith in Jesus and helps us to want to be more like Jesus. So, Instead of looking for signs and miracles, let's look for the signs he's actually showing us. And then, like the official who knew his son was healed, we can start to rest in the promise that God tells us from Romans chapter eight, that he is working all things out for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Doesn't mean we're gonna like everything, but it's for our good. So let's be the believers who trust God is doing his things. Let's look for what he is doing and rest in his promises and then by faith participate in what he is doing to save others. So by way of conclusion, Jesus does the Father's will. Jesus as God the Son is in perfect relationship to God the Father and they share the same will. And the Father's will is to save Jesus has done the Father's will. And what Jesus did was live the life that we couldn't in perfect holiness and sinlessness. And then he took on our punishment on the cross. He not only took on the physical suffering of the cross, but he also felt what it was like to be forsaken by the Father, what we should have felt. Then he rose from the dead and provides us with eternal life. When we put faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that's what we get. And that means that since that's what Jesus did, that's what the Father wants for us. God the Father wants relationship with us. And finally, Jesus gives us signs. Jesus has submitted the evidence to us through his life, his ministry, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And as we put faith in Jesus, we get to see even more of that evidence as he works in our lives to transform us. So I have a few questions for you. Are you living your life according to God's will for your life? In other words, have you put faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins? And if you've already done that, are you letting Jesus be the Lord of your life? Is he the most important thing in your life? Secondly, knowing how much God loves you, how are you showing that love to others? We see today that it is not only that Jesus saves us from our sins, but it's also the Father's will that Jesus did that. That's how much God loves you. So how are you showing that love of God to those people that God has put in your life? Because even Jesus loved the Samaritans, people he was supposed to culturally hate. And lastly, are you looking for signs? And I mean this in two ways. Are you looking for God to do some sort of miracle of your choosing or to operate the way you think he ought to? Or are you recognizing that he has given us signs and is still working in us and transforming us? That's the biggest sign of all, the biggest miracle of all, miracle of all is seeing the sinner transformed. Let me pray. Father, again, we are so thankful. We are thankful that it has been your will to save us all along. And Jesus, we're thankful that you came down and made that possible. You lived the life that we couldn't, and you became the punishment that we couldn't take. You took it for us because you love us. And Holy Spirit, we are thankful that you have worked on our lives, that you have helped us to put faith in Jesus, and that you're still doing a transforming work in our lives. And though we still struggle, you're giving us victory over the course of our lives as you're making us more like Jesus. So Lord, this morning, I ask that you would remind us in every moment that you love us. And Lord, that you would help us to take that love and show it outwardly to the people that you have put in our lives. Lord, we want you to be the Lord of our life. We want you to get all the glory for our lives. But we can't do it on our own. We need your strength. We need your wisdom. We need you to do a mighty work in us. So we ask that you would do that this morning and every day you allow us to walk here on this earth until we go to be in your presence for eternity. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
So our final song this morning is a new one called Christ Our Wisdom. And Jesus has many things to us. He's our King, He's our Lord, He's our Savior, but He's also our comfort, our grace, and our wisdom for living. So as we stand and sing this together, I think you'll pick up on the melody, but let's sing together Christ Our Wisdom. Christ our wisdom, we are humble when you hide your ways from us. You have purposes unnumbered, each one good and glorious. Help us trust when we grow weary, free us from our anxious thoughts. Give us grace to see more clearly. You are God and we are not. Christ our wisdom be our gladness when we fail to understand. You ordain all joy and sadness to fulfill your perfect plan. Help us know you rule with power over every raging flood. In our most uncertain hour, you are God and we are love. our wisdom we will follow though the way ahead is bare as we journey through the shadows grant us faith when sight is failed help us cling to your commandments strengthened by your faithful word we will Bless each other as we go by reading from Jude together. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you today. You're dismissed.